This is my friend Jack Topper. He is a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt and all around most interesting person I think I know. Uh, Jack, I'm going to let you kind of introduce yourself just a little bit about kind of where you train, where you live, and um, and then you can get into how we met because I think it's kind of a funny story how we got together. So I'll let you kind of go ahead with that. Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, so I, I grew up in Salt Lake City and I left, well, actually I started jujitsu in Salt Lake City in 1995 with Pedro Sauer. I think I got my blue belt in like 98, 99. You know, there were some breaks and stuff like that. It wasn't super consistent training. Yeah. <clears throat> and then I uh, ended up moving to Southern California in um, about 2000. And, um, uh, you know, I called Pedro. I said, hey, I'm out here. And he's like, you have to train with Hicks and those guys. And funny enough, it was actually in 1995 or 96, I went to a Hicks and Gracie seminar in Tampa, Florida. I've got uh, uh, some family who lives out there. Oh, okay. And, uh, so I was like, what were you doing in Tampa? That's the wrong end of the U.S., man. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, at that time, my brother had moved out there. Now I have a couple other family members and nephews and nieces out there. But um, during the, the Hickson seminar, I ended up at the end of it, I rolled with one of his brown belts who was assisting him. And it's, it, was, it turned out to be David Kama. And um, oh, yeah. I'm really bad with remembering people's names, but I'm really good at faces. And so it was like 2000, 2001, I went to, um, back in the day, we, there, we didn't have the IBJJF tournaments here in the US. And I think, I think it was um, called Copa Pacifica. But anyway, I was watching this uh, jiu-jitsu tournament. It, that's a guy named uh, Clever Luciano. He's uh, kind of an old school Brazilian dude. But yeah. um, No, I remember, uh, I remember Clever um, just because his first name was funny. Yeah. So it was like, it always stuck with me, of, but, but that was way back yeah way back then man yeah yeah old old school um but yeah and then back then if the, you said you were told your match was going to go on at noon it would happen at probably about three or four yeah, yeah three thirty and four o'clock yeah if you were fighting a brazilian they were just going to win that's what was going to happen yeah <clears throat> so it was all pretty shady and everything um i remember that my brazilian friend he's like one of our black belts his name's fernando but he was telling the guy, he's like, no, no, he's, 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 he made weight. Don't worry about it. Don't, they didn't even check. Yeah. Yeah. Like I've that. been on that end of it too. <laughs> yeah. He's good, man. No, he's good. Yeah. No, he's yeah, waiting. Yeah, yeah. Oh, really? Okay. We trust you. Yeah. So uh, cool. anyway, I, um, I was sitting at the tournament and right next to me, I look and I'm like, oh, I remember you. I rolled with you in four one time and uh, you were brown, but with Hicks and he goes, yeah, I got my black belt now. And uh, so I've been training with Dave Kama since uh, the year 2000, which is nuts to me. It's, it's been 20 years man yeah, yeah like you know not a spring chicken anymore i mean no I'm, I'm starting to feel it too i'm getting stronger i'm putting on my man weight but um definitely not uh the joints and the recovery is takes a little bit yeah. longer no it yeah. does no you gotta i just love your background and we'll get more into that too but so now okay. the the funny story of how we ran into each other and what brought you to arkansas well i was working with a consulting group that uh um, they, they, they consult us like small doctor's offices, chiropractors, things like that. So I was out there and I think, didn't I hit up, I think I messaged you first, like, Hey, I'm a Jack. I'm a, a yeah. black belt. Is it cool if I come in and train? And uh, randomly, of course I said, no, I was like, yeah, no, not at all. You're not welcome. Yeah. <laughs> I think you didn't reply actually. I'm not sure. But. <laughs> oh, no way. <laughs> no, but I, I came in there and, um, I met Mikey and then, uh, yeah, uh, ran into you there, and um, we've been friends since. I, I don't think, what was that, five years ago? Man, it was longer than that, I think. I think it was six, yeah. the six. I think I was looking back. So the irony of it is this. So we have we had gotten into a fitness center. You know, we acquired the fitness center, and there were these fitness classes, which we knew nothing about, and we were just like, what do we do? Well, one of those classes had the, had this lady in it and her husband oh, yeah. on a chiropractor clinic. Yeah, Todd Wolf. So, that was Todd Wolf. Yeah, him and Emily. And so when you were consulting for them and you had found us, well, it was just so ironic because it was in the family. Well, now what's funny is little Trevor is now training at the Rogers location. Awesome. So the Wolves have come full circle to where, you know, like they, they've, <laughs> they've been in forever. Yeah. And I kind of hold them responsible for all of your antics and everything that, that you've been in my life about. So I blame yeah. Emily and Todd all the time. I'm like, it is your fault uh, for those <laughs> stories, which there's a I few of those. We'll get into that too. But yeah, that I thought it was just ironic. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Small world. 
Yeah. I mean, just, yeah. and the funniest thing to me was, so we, it was like after I think the first night we had trained or something and out in the parking lot, you're like, dope. No, dude, bro. Like, seriously, like, like, did I suck? Like, was it bad? Because you've been <laughs> yeah. off the mat and you're like, I've been off the mat for a long time. Yeah. I was yeah. out of shape and it was like, I was just hanging on for dear life. Yeah. It was just so funny. Cause you were just like, no man, I got to get better. You got to tell me the truth. Yeah, I, it was just so funny. So I was like, man, it was all good. I mean, we trained, it'll get better. And yeah. and of course, you know, since then, every time we train, you just like squeeze and smash on me because you're all like super strong and no yeah. shit. So apparently it's working. Um, yeah, good. Wait, I wanted to say one other thing about Small World. Uh, the time that we randomly met up in Melbourne, Australia. Yes. So I had a trip to Australia for Sauteropolis, you know, went down to help him open the school and do some training. And then ironically, you had posted a picture on Facebook and you were, and we were both in the same city and I was like, wait a minute. So yeah. we actually, and that's the picture I posted in the group that you guys saw whenever I put the topic about this conversation is that was what that we were on the beach in Melbourne whenever yeah. we began to check randomly, not even planned, <laughs> yeah. but that's just kind of how we roll in. Um, yeah, and that's one thing that like our friendship has always been unique to me because one, like, I mean, I consider us really close, but I'm kind of a weird social person, but it's always unusual because like, we won't talk for months, but whenever I do yeah. see you or talk to you, I mean, it's just like, it's like you were here yesterday. Yeah, pick it up. I, yeah. It, it's, uh, it's always been strange. I'm like, I don't know why I mean this guy just along so well, man, but it just, uh, yeah. it works that way and I love it. So it's been a good trip. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, I appreciate your friendship too. I, I actually remembered one other uh, random running that we had. I was flying from the East Coast. I think it was from Albany, New York, um, to back to California. And this jackhole, pardon the pun, this like total dirtbag guy, he's trying to like cram his bag into um, the, the overhead carry thing and he's slamming it and slamming it and he breaks it and it won't latch anymore. Yep, I remember the that last, yeah, so I had a layover. Oh, wait, was it a layover? No, I was, yeah, anyway, I think it was a layover that that happened. I, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was a layover. Where was, anyway, I don't remember the details, but then I, I called you up and I'm like, the the guy broke the, the thing. It was the last flight out. It's going to take the mechanic hours to get here. And like, there's, I need a place to stay. So yeah. Uh, you guys, yeah, I crashed at your guys' house uh, one night randomly. I forgot all about that. Yeah, no, yeah. I had forgotten all about that because that was here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because now since that story, like every time I'm on an airplane and some dude's jacking with the door, I'm always like, easy with that. You're going to get us stranded here, man. You know, yeah. like, don't be hulking out on that thing. Cause they will not let us out of here. Oh exactly. yeah. I forgot all about that. Um, yeah. now another one was whenever we did meet because you were here for a few days, you know, I like invited you out to dinner and then you actually yeah. ended up going over to the house, which I guess they don't do that in California very much where it's like, Hey, let's go yeah, get yeah. something to eat. Yeah, that's like, hey, let's make plans, and it's like, yeah, awesome, cool, sounds good, and then you just never reach out and contact the person ever again. So yeah, it was cool. Um, at the we went to a steakhouse. I forget the. I always get mixed up. Bentonville, Russellville. Yeah, all runs together. Yeah. But um, yeah, we ended up at that steakhouse. Uh, had a great dinner, and then yeah, uh, back yeah, at the house. I remember because there was another time that uh, we actually cooked for you at the house. Yeah, hung out here, you know, like, so yeah, we just, we got a, a various background and had good times. But so now one story that uh, I know you have was so back when you were training in the late nineties, you actually went on one of the original Gracie cruises, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Why don't you tell us something about that? Yeah. So I had this friend um, who was training at the Gracie Academy. He's like, I'm going on the ship. You, you got to come with me. You got to do it. So he talked me into it. And, um, I show up there. I'd never been on a cruise ship before. It was a three-day cruise from Long Beach, California, down to um, Encinitas or Encinitas or something like that. Yeah. And um, it was a regular cruise ship, but there just happened to be about um, 300, 500, or maybe it's like 300 jujitsu people. And then all the rest of the cruise was just its crazy normal cruise. Right. So um, I put my phone on silent, but it's vibrating. I got to hang up on this thing. No, it's all good, man. Okay, let me just put it all the way on silent. Um, yeah, so, uh, ended up on the Gracie cruise and crazy, uh, Hedon and Henner were, I think blue, maybe purple belts. 
And then, um, yeah, so this was a long time ago. You know, wow. Hori and Gracie was there, and Elio Gracie was there, which was completely like blew my mind because the founder of jujitsu and he's over by the pool you know um to sit with his shirt off and his sunglasses like drinking a fruit juice just being like yeah you know uh 80 year old badass so it was pretty cool yeah no that uh that was cool now you said that uh yeah there... i was gonna say there's one story that really stood out about uh alio yeah so i was sitting on the side of the mat and then he was he was pretty close he was sitting on a white chair just kind of watching the mats and stuff and uh, I, I might have been talking to Henner or Hidon, and um, uh, this guy comes on the mat, really close. He's like, you know, he sees him. He's like, hi, thank you. Like, oh, wow, you know, nice to meet you. And, um, he, you know, he goes to start getting on the mat. And he had these big, you know, like plugs in his ear. And then Elio is like, I don't speak Portuguese. Bah, 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 you know? And then the guy looked at Henner and Hidon, and he's like, what did he say? And he goes, oh, he asked if you could remove your earrings before getting on the mat. And it was one of those like lost in translations because Elio's sentence was like this many words. Right, like, you're like, yeah. it didn't seem. And hmm. I was like, yeah, take the earrings out before the mat. Uh, and then he's like, is that what he actually said? And he goes, well, what he actually said, and it, it was a perfect translation. And it was so politely conveyed. He's like, what he actually said is he's going to rip those fucking earrings out of your face with a choke if you don't take them off. And the guy's eyes are like saucers. And so then, but he was like, yeah, so please take them off and then you're welcome to jo get on the mat. Yeah, it's like, no, I don't think I, I want to anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I oh, thought that was funny. And Elio's so gangster, I think he probably would have. He would have got a high oh, choke man. and then just, yeah, worked like, his Like, you know, I always make the joke. I'm like, dude, the Gracies are like Ice Cube, man. Like, everybody sees them on the Disney Channel, but don't forget where they came from, man. Like, like yeah. there's, there's some serious stuff there. I mean, because when you're doing open challenges and street fights and, Stuff yeah. like that. I mean, like that's that's a real deal. And of course, now you know it's grown and, and the industry's changed and it's jujitsu's for everybody. But uh, yeah. it wasn't always for everybody. Which you had mentioned something like that because uh, something about a choke that Helio was was talking about, and then oh, yeah. ran into uh, I don't remember who you're trained with, but something about you know that a detail. Yeah, I'll tell you the story. Um, so on that Gracie cruise, um, and that was the only time I had a class with Helio. But um, he, he, he was going over his cross-collar choke because that's his favorite choke. But he was saying when you have the choke applied onto them, and then once you get it, like, sunken and good, you pop their head once, and he goes, it, it knocks them out. And I, I haven't experimented with it, but I should. But, um, and I'd never seen anyone cover that detail ever before. Sometimes when the chin's in, you can shake them, and then, you know, you'll get the choke deeper and deeper. But this wasn't that. This is when the choke is in, you give them a whack. Yeah. And uh, apparently, Elia just, her Elia just puts him right out. So funny enough, at, I was at the 99th birthday. Of, it, at, I don't think it was the 100th. It was the 99th birthday. I went up and um, there was a big, huge free seminar with like 200 people um, at the Gracie Academy. And so Horian taught, um, the boys taught. There was like, you know, we just went over basic like self-defense techniques and stuff. But um, Horian went over in really, really good detail. I mean, like, he's a really good and gifted instructor. And he went over the choke and really broke it down. And then we were all working on it. And he came and he's like, okay, hey, let me feel your choke. Okay, you know, he worked with, like, almost every person in the room. And at the end, he's like, okay, everyone, does anyone have questions? And I was like, I do. And um, he goes, yeah, what's your question? I go, uh, I got a lesson from the old man one time on the choke. And he said to snap the head to put him unconscious. And... Um, and then Horgan was just like, yep, okay, next question. And I was like, that, why, why did you leave it out? Two, why did you just blow past it? And like, is it, does it really hurt people? Is that a family oh, secret? Yeah. Like, I, like, I don't know. But yeah, yeah I'm sure it was like all of the above that he's like, yeah, the last thing I need you guys doing that don't know anything is trying to like snap each other's head, <laughs> yeah. and head button each other and whiplash. And, yeah. But yeah, those fundamental. Now, so since you were around the Gracie so much and stuff back in those days, do you feel like it was a little bit more self-defense oriented back then? Oh, a hundred percent. And that's why I learned jujitsu is to learn how to fight. I saw, right. you know, the UFC. So Pedro Sauer, you know, he used to do challenge matches in Salt Lake City. So it was always like we would train and it was like, okay, pause, you know, like go ahead and see if you can hit the guy and make sure you know where your head is. Okay. You got to adjust or block that. So it was, the emphasis was always on um, the self-defense part. 
Um, and then it was funny. I remember, I think it was right around blue belt or right before I got my blue belt. Um, he's like, yeah, there's a tournament in California. If anyone wants to drive out there, we can go do it. And he's like, by the way, there's these rules. You get like points. And then to, uh, we were like, oh, what are points? Points. Like, what that, that for? Yeah. So it was a very different feel. And uh, um, training with Dave, um, comma, uh, and Hickson at that, at Hickson at the time on Saturdays, I'd drive up to the, uh, his academy and train um, back in the day. Um, but yeah, it was always about the self-defense and the, that yeah. stuff. Hickson is kind of blended though, a little bit like he's yeah. got, it, it's not, I mean, it's a real emphasis on fighting and all that stuff, but he's like, when it's jujitsu versus jujitsu, this is how you have to handle it. Correct. So I actually talked to him, um, Maybe it was last year we had this conversation, but uh, he was just saying for him, from white to blue belt should really be just the core self-defense, but they've seen kind of like everything. He goes, it should be like a year or two years up to blue belt, but that's jujitsu against people who don't know anything. And pretty much yeah. after blue belt forward, you're dealing with jujitsu against jujitsu. Like counter they're, they're to counter. Winning slice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one thing, uh, like, I think that's one thing that people, they lose one thing I've noticed is when people are singularly focused on a martial art where it's all like, I only do boxing. I only do yeah. jiu-jitsu. You know, I feel like sometimes their perspective is a, is a little bit skewed. Um, and they don't understand like when you go back to base physiology of just how the body moves. And then when you move into like attribute development where mm -hmm. like, if I go look at the best fighter on the planet, boxing probably gets paid the most money. UFC, you know, they're also high paid sometimes, not very often, but sometimes, yeah. you look at the best fighters on the planet with basically unlimited resources. Most of them jump rope very often. So yeah. therefore I can basically infer that jumping rope builds good attributes by modeling. And when you look at what it does scientifically, but I would never take a jump rope into the cage. You know, I'm not using it during the fight, which I mean, if, you know, if I could whip somebody or choke somebody with it, that'd be fun. But, but it's just like, you know, it's attribute development, just like lifting weights. It's like, you're never going to take weights in a barbell to go beat somebody up, but it's attribute development. And I think sometimes, especially with jujitsu, like that gets lost where all of the high speed sport play accelerates attributes for realistic self-defense. And there are certain switches that do need to toggle you know, for you to run that different execution style of like, if I'm going to strike rather than choke versus hold, you yeah. know, and I feel like some people will get lost with that where it turns into polarized of like, you're either this or you're that when it's like, yeah. mm, I mean, you take the best sport guy on the planet and you tell him, Hey man, no rules, do what you want. He's probably going to do okay against the guy that's all like pushing and shoving on him and knows a couple things, you know, like, yeah. Um, no, I agree with that 100%. And I, I do think that, you, I mean, you get, you learn how to control someone's body. You learn how to um, control your body. You know the positions and all that stuff. But on the other hand, um, like some jujitsu where you're bare bowing in upside down or your only setups for the arm bar or, you know, that type of stuff. It's like you can get pounded. Even like deep half and uh, that type of position, when you got a, a, a like, someone who like skateboards or is a surfer or was a wrestler and just has good balance and base, they could be banging on the back of your head. And if that's kind of your go-to as like, I'm going to pull half guard and go like, you know, and that. Um, it's almost like there's a, it's almost like there's a curve. You know, funniest thing. I couldn't even tell you who told me this example. I can't even remember, but somebody once told me, they said, Caleb, look at it this way. When you start training martial arts, you can kill this much of the population. Your goal yeah. is to get better so you can kill this much of the population. I was like, yeah. dang, man, that's a little extreme. But, yeah. you know, the idea was that whenever you're stepping into the martial arts, and I think that's one thing that uh, especially Americans really focus on is like, how good am I compared to last week? How good am I compared to last month? How good am I compared to the other guy that's been training for a month? Because when you look at traditional martial arts, you know, they would do like the old katas, left side forward, right side forward. They do all these drills that were not live or active, you know, and from a military standpoint, it made sense because it's like you start training age five, you have to be able to battle to save the village by yeah. age 16. We yeah. didn't really care how good you were at age eight, nine, and 10 because it was like, it was irrelevant. Like you need to know everything because at age 16, when people are trying to come and end your life or something, like you're going to have to know all of it. So this whole measuring and competing 
along the way, you know, that's, that's a very, uh, you know, kind of a modern idea that, that it is fun, it increases engagement, it makes people better, it increases their curve. But I feel like sometimes it creates um, kind of a flawed measurement where it's like, you will do things to win at the white belt that may not serve you very well at the black belt. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, it's, um, if you're just in it for the long run and just know that you're gonna get better and learn and improve, um, I think your journey will be good. I've got one student, um, he only cares about his belt. He's like, I, am I a purple yet? I'm a purple, I'm, right, I'm a purple. And he's like, and he's a sales guy too, but he's just, and he's also fun to talk to, but it's like, every week it's like about my promotion about this about that so he puts all this stress on himself he's yeah. actually an older guy so he really has a goal he started at age 60 and he's like he really wants to get his black belt at 70 yeah um but he's like oh, but it's annoying but it's like dude don't worry about it like yeah. your, your guard sucks like his top game is fantastic i'm like your guard sucks like you gotta learn you know you gotta get well-rounded you gotta like, figure this stuff out um but he competes in his uh, age bracket and he won like uh, worlds for his um, That's masters. Awesome. Yeah. That's so he's awesome. like, see, I'm a purple belt. Give me my belt. And it's like, yeah. just stop. <laughs> stop. Yeah. It's like, you know, and that's one thing, like when people try to define rank so much that, cause I can remember being young and dumb and, and man, the way that I looked at rank and how it worked and how I believed it should work. I mean, it was very in line with a lot of people that are young and doing the same, like, you know, the same perspectives exist and I can identify with them. And I can remember at that age and at that position, you could not talk any sense into me. Like, I mean, it was just, you just had to let me be dumb. Like Dring was so patient with me. <laughs> um, my funniest story of like, when I had a hard lesson of rank, cause we talked about it yesterday when we went to Brazil, like in 08 and I competed as a blue belt. And I just knew, I was like, man, I all week I was just killing it and doing a good job and great in all the academies. And, and I was like, man, if I win this on Saturday, man, that's going to be my purple belt. That's going to be my purple belt. So I go out there and, you know, we go through the division and then I, I get caught up and the guy's running a point game on me. Like this guy was running sport jujitsu. I was still like MMA fighter, cage fighter, dumb as a rock. And I was caught up and I just was like, why isn't he attacking me? Because I was so shocked. I mean, he was just, he was holding me and I just, I couldn't understand. So I like shoved my arm in trying to get him to go for an arm bar so I could maybe escape to get a guard pass. He wasn't yeah. having any part of it because he was up on points. So I, yeah, he's just gonna... it was terrible. I go up to uh, the stands and I'm just sulking and sitting around feeling sorry for my house. So like, so like two hours later, Dring walks by and he's like, Hey, are you okay? What's going on? It's like, man, coach, you know, I just, I just knew that if I won today, like it was going to be that purple belt, and blah, 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 all this. He just looks at me and he goes, yeah, you messed that up. Walked up. <laughs> and I was just like, what? And it just, you know, and now, you know, he explains it with my experience. It's just when people try to define rank, it's just, it's too big to almost articulate. It's almost like when I talk to people about training in Brazil and, and, and doing the camp and, and just experiencing the culture down there and, and that you know you have a country that that created this style and this art form like it just affects you in a weird way that's hard to articulate and i sometimes yeah. feel like ranks the same thing like it's just it's hard to articulate because it's such a personal journey it know? really is and um it's also really arbitrary you know it's like yeah like you you and me could have attended all the exact same classes and i'm going to be really good at these things and poor at those things you're going to be good at these things you need work on that and, uh, you know, there's, there's guys who compete well, but their jujitsu kind of sucks. There's guys that are super, they're just not um, competitive people and it's not an urge to them, but they're really technical, they're knowledgeable. And then you get, you know, different like body styles and stuff like that. But like, it's so you have a guy who really deserves a blue belt, but he's got high this and then he gets, I don't, you know what I'm saying? Like everyone's yeah. just different. Everybody's so got different like, attributes. Yeah. Usually yeah. what I tell people is I'm like, rank's a reflection of two things. One, it's a relationship with your coach. Yeah. And two, it is the movement upon your baseline and your progression, you know, of like what you can achieve. And that looks different for different people because right. like your guy that's a little bit older, man, if it was 2000, that guy would have never gotten a blue belt from anybody. Cause it'd be right. like, Oh no, man, he can't do this or that. Like, 
if you just can't do the move, you can't do it. And so like people are getting educated, like rank is a little bit interpretive on that person's individual journey, which makes it yeah. tough when you want to go to a tournament or you want to go to a structured system, you know, because everybody kind of moves together, but there's a little bit of variance. And, and I think that's where it falls on the coach to make sure that he's yeah. pouring into his students and they are achieving the potential that he sees that they are able to. And the bigger yeah. victory is whenever they see the potential that they were able to achieve, because that's the whole goal, man. You know, like really what you're doing for people is giving them a platform to see what they're capable of. Yeah. That's a yeah, good way to look at it. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say one other thing too. Um, like, you know, one day you and I are going to be older and our bodies are going to be more broken down, but you'll be a multi-degreed um, black belt, fourth or fifth. And then you're going to get this like young stud competitive brown belt and he might catch you and uh, take your lunch money and everything. But does that mean you're now not a black belt? You know what I mean? So it's kind of like, there's that factor too. It's like, you know, there's an interesting kind of thing. Um, you know, I try not to get, you know, too controversial stuff, but there's an interesting thing in judo that actually references that where there's a lot of old school um, ideas and styles where like you can only achieve certain rank. Like if you have done so much for the style or the art, you know, like I don't know a lot about it, but I just, I've, I've heard that discussion with a few friends that are some higher level judo players um, where that's been mentioned where, you know, like not everybody just progresses to the seventh, eighth, ninth, like, like it caps, you know, and I don't know if like this is actively practiced by associations or, you know, but I just remember that conversation where they were kind of looking at like, you know, just because this guy trained for his whole life and this guy went to the Olympics, they both will not achieve the end goal. And, you know, and it just, and it goes back to a lot of things that honestly, man, are just not a big priority to me because I'm yeah. just like, uh, I remember that, that years ago, matter. I would just like tell the guys circle up, take off your belts and then let's train what changed. You know, it's like nothing. Exactly. Yeah. Just, you know, yeah. you know, the mats, but you're dealing with humans. So that part's going to come up periodically. So I just, you know, I'm like, stay focused on the training, the rank will chase you kind of, the, you know, a little bit of the drink speech where it's just like, man, it'll find you just, just keep yeah. working hard and training. So, um, yeah, you goes to the oh, next thing. Real, oh, you're real fortunate to have drink as the coach. That, that, I love that guy. Yeah. Man, I'm telling you, like that was a real pivotal point because then I had trained with a lot of people and when I met Dring, like, man, one, the synergy. Like, he was just like, because I was into mixed martial arts and all doing these different things. But the biggest thing, and this goes to a point that I wanted to make when we were discussing with you, because one of the biggest things, he immediately was like, here's the best people on the planet, and I need to get you in front of them. Like, yeah. that was always his methodology. It wasn't like, no, I know better than anybody. I'm right. smarter than all of them, and I am the grandmaster ninja guy. It was just like, hey, here's the best striker on the planet, the best jiu-jitsu guy on the planet. And he always was pushing me to go train with the best on the planet, you know. And I was like, uh, okay. Um, yeah. And that's one thing that, you know, that you always have exuded is like, I have never one time heard you say no to whenever somebody needed help or wanted instruction, um, seminars, training. Like, never if I ever – and I'm sure it's existed, but I just consistently it has always been – Hey man, whatever you need, like I'm in, whether there was a financial gain, no financial gain, or even a cost to you, yeah. uh, which I've always admired. And Thank two, you. I've never, I've never seen you ever correct somebody to a degree of like, Oh, Hey, don't do this. Like I've never seen that. And I know there's times with like new white belts where it's all like, Hey, don't put your hand in the triangle. Yeah, but exactly. it, you have always been so upfront whenever one, you haven't seen in something. I've never seen that or I don't recall it ever. That's really cool. That's neat. Show it to me. Like I see that more out of you than I, than I see out of a lot of guys I know, um, you know, cause you're just such an eager learner that most people are really excited to talk about what, what they know. And yeah. you're always real quick to be like, well, Hey, here's something cool that I learned. So what are you doing? You know? Yeah. And that's one thing that I remember you always bugging me. Like you show me something cool. Hickson showed you and you'd be like, Hey, you show me something. I'm like, like, yeah, what, man, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I forget was something. There was one. I, it sucks that I don't remember it right now, but I remember I took one of your classes. But it was this. There was a really cool transition that you had. It was from the guard. I forget what it was right now off the top of my head, but I was like, "Oh, that is sick," and I've never seen that before. But you know, I learned that um, the first obstacle to learning, the first thing that's going to prevent someone to learn, is them thinking they know it already. So yeah. it's like, 
you know, you know, it's interesting too. Like um, the the armbar from guard, the white belt, blue belt, purple belt learned it the same move that I did, but you just practice it and get better and better and better until you get it up to like a black belt level. It's the same move. So sometimes a purple belt's like, I already know that. I'm like, can you hit it on a black belt? No. So do you actually know it yet? Like, let's let's keep practicing it. So you always got to have that mind frame of like. I don't know everything. I need to learn. There is, yeah, and there's, there's not just one way to skin a cat. You know what I mean? So that I, that's one thing when I try to correct people. I'm like, yeah. yeah, like, okay, well, you could do that. This is why I like it this way, and so here's the reasoning behind it. And then, and that's where it almost goes like to that that chaining theory, where it's like, and that's one thing I run into like with low ranks is especially purple belts, you know, because they they got their style, you know, yeah. and they're good. Like, you know, I mean, they yeah. know jujitsu, man. I mean, it's been three, yeah, four, five, six real. years. Some yeah. of them are animals and try to rip your face off and, and they're super talented. And so they're like, well, this is what I like to do, but they don't understand that there's a, a synergy of movement. Sometimes it's like, we want this grip because this is correlated to like these three other things that we haven't even discussed yet. It's like right. in the next couple of years, <laughs> yeah. these other three things where we chain them together, you know, um, yeah. man, I can just remember being that guy and I'm still that guy sometimes where I just don't know what I don't know. But I can remember yeah. when I was younger where I'll just be like, no, I just like to do this. I like to do this. And, yeah. and Dring would just be like, dude, you just got to trust me at a certain point. You know, yeah. like there's, at, at some level, you've got to have some, some trust for some advice. I'm not saying it's the only way, but yeah. here's the, there's a strategy here that I'm trying to work on over like a long period. But so with the guys that you teach, um, if you had to pick one of the, biggest struggles of getting people to comprehend information what would it be um I, man i don't know like it's funny because i feel like i would have to take responsibility for it so i think it would be my um articulation of it you know some people um i have a student who if you show it to him, he's just going to look at you all freaking confused. But if you probably wrote it down in a paragraph of just words, he'd be like, oh, well, why didn't you say so? So I've got some students that I got, well, actually, he, there's only one of him. But, um, uh, but so sometimes just figuring out the best way to work with someone. And if, if I'm like more like, no, I want you to feel it. I want you to feel it. And they're not getting it. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, I probably got to explain it. Okay, like I want you to pull like this way and engage your hand that way. And then sometimes, so let me just do it to someone else so you can watch. So it probably just, um, yeah, I think it would just be me just kind of missing the right way to explain it to him. I think that would be the, the most difficulty that I would have in getting someone to convey. You know, though, every now and again, like there's like the, the way that Hickson does his back take, I learned it and it's like, it's different than how most people do it. He's like really heavy with the top leg and he's chopping your, your other leg out. And so he's kind of doing the scissor motion with his legs. And um, I just couldn't for the life of me do it. And it just wouldn't work, wouldn't work, wouldn't work. And so, you know, there's those moves that you learn that you're just, that's your retarded move. And it's yeah. like. And Oma Plata was that for me for like a decade. I, I couldn't get Oma Plata work for like 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> so. and, then, and then fortunately, like you, you keep training. So I, I went like me, I with that back take and I just threw it to the side and I'm like, ah, screw it. I'm just going to work on this other stuff right now. And I went back to it. Like I got to do it because man, the pressure that, when it like when you feel it done to you it's really impressive and um i go back to it still couldn't do it and i'm just you know i'm like a ret i'm just retarded and then uh it's finally tough. say it again it's gonna, tough it's man because there's there's so much there's so much information that you're trying to convey because there's all yeah. these micro movements too you know yeah. like your hips and your core and it's like flex your upper left ab and your right butt cheek you know like yeah, exactly I mean, uh -huh. there's just there's so much into it and then when you put a different body type in front of you it's completely different. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, so um, I'm, I was just going to say to answer that um, previous question, uh, sometimes you just run into the the guys, he's that move that you're trying to show him at that time, that's just his retard move. There's probably a better way to, uh, an inept, inept experience move. I don't know what it is, but. Right. You know that's well, that's, uh, that's usually, I call them blind spots. You know, okay, like, yeah. everybody's got blind spots. Like for me, like flower sweep was a big blind spot for me to wear that was one of the first moves I ever learned. And I was just so confused by it because one, 
I was thinking MMA, I was like, oh, I get punched in the face. And it's like, well, if you know what you're doing, you really don't. But, you, are, yeah. you, could, you know, but, and then two is like, I could never get it to work. You know, like it just, but now, I mean, that's one of my favorite techniques to show low ranks because it demonstrates so many fundamentals with one move. You know, I'm mm -hmm. like, one technique showing you so many different things to where, yeah, it may not be your go-to that you're going to hit the highest percentage, you know, as a white belt, but it's going to teach you so much that at blue belt, purple belt, it's going to pay off. And, yeah. and that goes back to sometimes just people able to see the long journey because there are so many times, man, that I just, I couldn't see the long play. I really couldn't. And I yeah. just was like, and I feel that when I run into issues with, stu <laughs> with students, sometimes like coronavirus. Okay. Yeah, I got the corona, man. You got to look out. Yeah. We're doing this on the computer. Don't catch it. I know. I had some, actually, right before we did this interview, I had like something. I had some rice and I had like a pizza and I was coughing. I'm like, oh, if I cough during this interview, everyone's going to think I'm going to. Yeah, yeah anybody locally that sees it's going to be like, don't go near this guy. Oh, man. But yeah, one of the, uh, one of the big things that I've noticed is because I feel it when I learn new things. Um, and recently I was getting educated on something new and I felt just like I did when I was white belt jiu-jitsu. I was like, yeah. I can yeah. feel my brain only able to see like this much and yeah. it's wanting to see more, but I just can't, my brain just yeah. can't comprehend it. Um, yeah. And I think that happens with jiu-jitsu where, you know, you're, you're saying 10 words, but they, you know, they're able to internalize just a couple, you know? Right. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it's tough, but so now, all right, I, I did make a note here because okay. like I said, one, we both are all over the place traveling all the time, and uh, you're getting a little bit more international work right now than I am, and it's funny we ran into each other, but so you've started a school in the Philippines. Yeah, yeah. Really awesome. I wanted you to tell a little bit of that story. Yeah, uh, totally. Uh, first, thanks for saying it's awesome. That means a lot to me. It's like, it's really fun to have those guys down there. Um, what had happened was the, I had done... I think my first seminar that I did, it was actually with a guy, Eddie Fivey, who I met on the internet just randomly. And then he saw I was visiting family in Tampa and uh, he goes, Hey, I see that you're super close. Maybe I can figure out a way to get you up here. Would you do a seminar? And uh, so I ended up going up there and that was the first seminar I did. I was nervous as hell. I was just like awkward and you know, like it was just, it was awkward. You awkward? No way. <laughs> yeah. Who, who, who would ever think that? Yeah. Uh, it was more awkward than usual. I'll tell you that. So, um, but I got that done and I started getting some seminars and you know how I met you and Brian Stubner. I was just in that city at that town. I was like, Hey, can I pop in and roll with you guys? And it's like, Oh, you want to teach a class? And so I just kind of got used to that. And then it just turned into seminars. And I, I um, anyway, so long story short, I'm sitting at home one day and um, I get a Facebook message. It's like, hi, you know, my name's Pat. Um, I train at a jujitsu school in Manila. Um, would you, uh, would you ever come out and do a seminar here? And uh, I, j I literally responded, yeah, sure. Throw me on a couch. Don't let me get stabbed. I'll do it. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. And I, oddly enough, I meant it. You know, yeah, I'm, like, yeah, yeah. Okay, like, like, I'm not it. saying it's not true, but. Yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah, because that was uh, the first time I would have left. I mean, I crossed the border to Canada, um, but I've, that was the first like, time I've been out of the U.S. So um, he's like, you know, he writes back, no, like, we'll put you up. We'll pay you for the seminar. What we'd like to do is have you up for a week and maybe just teach uh, classes each evening. So it's not like a, a two hour seminar, but we'll right. just, That's awesome. yeah. And man, I just had a great time there. Oh, I got a little weirded out. I'm like, is this legit or not? He goes, yeah, yeah. please send me uh, a you know, photo of your passport. And I was oh, like, no. oh, yeah, <laughs> no. yeah. I was like, who, who else have you had out there? Give me the location of the gym. And it's in this beautiful part of um, Manila. Manila has like third world rundown, like, yeah. Like you think Compton or something like that's bad? No, this is like it's like there's the favela. Some rough, there's some rough spots in that country. Yeah, no, no, like horribly rough. Um, but like the favela, and then right next to it is like Beverly Hills, all just in the same mixed up whatever. But this was in like the Beverly Hills area, and um, so I looked it up, and I'm like, who else have you had out there? And they go, oh, we've had Chris Howder, we had that Nick, uh, um, the that Hodger Gracie black belt. Nick, he he oh, runs yeah, Brotherhood yeah. Jiu-Jitsu. I was like, oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I sent my photo of my uh, passport and they, they brought me down. So that's my introduction to the Philippines in Manila. And then two, actually last year I was in Australia and that same group, um, they go, hey, would you, you know, you're just, you're so close. Maybe we can just fly you up and do you want to, do you have time to do, um, you know, five days of teaching again? It's like, absolutely. 
while I was there, so that we're going to call that school A, school B said, hey, I saw you're in town. Can I take a private from you? So I taught the guy a private. And after the hour was done, he's like, can we do another hour? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, can you come back tomorrow? Yeah. So um, anyway, I went back um, back to the U.S. And like two weeks later, I thought about those the, the private lessons. And I, I messaged the guy. I go, hey, you know, how's all that stuff sitting with you? I know it's a little different than the traditional Gracie Academy stuff because they were a CTC. Um, yeah. a certified training center under so they have to follow exactly the strict curriculum yeah. of the Gracie Academy and I was just like I know this is a little different there's some modifications that Hickson does versus uh the, you know the boys and then he goes yeah I have a question about why and I just followed up with them and made sure that it, you know it was working and um they just hit me back up and they said you know you're the the only black belt that's ever followed up and checked on us it's like we yeah. always have to Take contact the Gracie yeah it's like a one-way street and um, they go, you know, would you, would you be willing to um, come down here in March? So I was in there January and I said, yeah, we can do March. And uh, so I was like, yeah, we'll, we'll do it. And I'll teach at your academy. And they're like, cool. While I was there, they go, we have a proposal. We, we would like to affiliate under you. We're going to separate from the Gracie Academy and we'll do Jack Toffer Jiu Jitsu. And I was like, heck yeah, let's do yeah, that's this. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Well, because so there's so many little schools like that, that like they need somebody with that vested interest, you know, to kind of raise them up um you know because man i mean the one-way street thing like that's kind of how i ended up finding dream was like i just been on that road so many times getting used up and when you find people that invest in you and they're there for you they answer the phone they make the trips especially for you with it being international i mean you know them having somebody committed to them um I'm, I'm sure this was probably a major game changer for their school and their style and I'm, i mean it's i bet it's going really really well yeah, things are going well. I mean, they're on their cities on like martial lockdown, but so right. I'm just yeah. recording videos and we, we uh, created a, the like active members group. So it's yeah. like, okay, got te questions on technique. Let me shoot a video. You know, yeah. I was supposed to, I was actually supposed to be there on the 21st. I don't know what the date is today. I forgot. But. Yeah, no, nobody knows what day it is or what time it is. People are drinking by 9am. Like it's Sunday and they're working and it's like, We've yeah. all lost track of time. So. Everything is mixed up. I taught my first online jujitsu private today. It was um, it was so weird. Was it? Yeah. I left, yeah. I left my uh, my gi and my belt over oh, there, yeah. but, uh, but it was right before our call. But yeah, I was like, this is so weird. But it actually worked out great. You know, there were, um, it was actually uh, Brian and Cora. And, oh yeah, uh, yeah, 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 man. So they were like, we just want to re go over stuff that you showed us the last time you were here. So it was, it was. I think that was an easier first digital private. You well, know, I mean, you know, and you guys all being so close and, you know, yeah. them being yeah. in the family and everything. I mean, it's yeah. like, if, if you're seeing me, you're seeing Brian and Cora. I mean, like, yeah, yeah that, uh, that works really well. I bet they had a good time with that. Cause I know they're on the same deal that we are where it's like, nobody can train everything. So I'm sure they've drug out the mats and yeah. they're doing cool stuff and having a good time. Cause yeah, they were I, in the, I've yeah, got, they looked I got two of the guys that I basically are my Corona brothers that I'm like, okay, if I get Corona, you're yeah. getting it because yeah. I got to be able to keep doing some stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I have uh, uh, one Corona brother. Um, he's a guy, he um, ended up buying like a block of like 20 uh, lessons. Yeah. And, uh, but he's like, I'm dude, I need to train. I'll go psychotic. Yeah. It's funny. I, you know, it's really funny. Um, I, I could name drop, but I won't, but I do have a buddy who um, uh, he, anyway, I talked to him uh, yesterday. I think it was yesterday, maybe the day before. But he goes, man, I'm like, how are you doing? Are you safe? Everything's good. You know, he's got a, a house up in the Hollywood Hills and stuff. And he's like, yeah, that guy, I'm so happy I have a gym in my garage because I can go lift and kettlebells and do my stuff, but I'm not rolling at all. Ooh, and he goes, yeah. he goes, the funny thing is, he goes, I, I told my wife, like, I feel so good physically. Like, you know, I'm taking care of myself. I'm eating. And she's like, no, you idiot. This is the first time in like years you haven't done jujitsu. Yeah, two weeks. exactly. Yeah. So Oh yeah. The body <laughs> like, starts healing. You're like, my shoulders feel great, man. Yep, like my yeah. neck isn't sore. Like golly. Lately I've, my fingers have been, and I never, like, I'm not a big grip guy, but they've just been a little, they were acting up, but this has been good for my uh, hands to recover a little bit. Yeah. yeah. No, that's so funny. Yeah. Our Corona brothers are all out there. Um, for whenever it's like, Hey man, if I'm going down, you're going with me because it's just like, gosh, man, you just can't do nothing. Uh, yeah. You know, and actually, and Brian and Cora, like, they just got the new gym, man. They just expanded, and I know they've been slammed, swamped with all that. I've been seen on Facebook. I hadn't got to talk to them because, uh, yeah. you know, things have been crazy up here as well. But um, so I know they've been busy, so I'm sure needing some jujitsu is a big priority for them. And, 
Yeah. And, and you know, and everybody's been kind of like getting their workouts in and finding a way to, to make things happen. But yeah. You it's, know, I it's always anything. wanted to make fun of those people who have like the Bob doll. And then there was another guy, a student of mine says, Hey, what do you think of this thing? And it's like this weird ball with like four like pegs that I, I don't know. So you can like roll on it and transition and stuff. Yeah. And I always would have uh, trashed it except for I'm like, yeah, it actually, you can use it to drill on. The yeah. other thing, and it, it's funny, I, my uh, strength and conditioning coach, he's 230 pounds of just muscle. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I need to learn uh, your cross side and how to get heavier. And I was like, okay. And it's just like, Ugh! like I, it's, it's a lot of weight. And especially when I'm telling him like right where to do it and here's how you make him suffer. And I was like, we were at his gym. I was like, okay, I tell you what, we, I just got a big sandbag. And I'm like, that's my body. So, cause he gets like kind of a rigid. So I needed him to have hip movement and be able to switch, rotate around and stuff. And, uh, but it was just killing me. Like, I'm like, if we, he and I roll, I will never let him get cross side because I just can't handle it. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's like, like he might crack your skull where it's all like, oh yeah, man. Yeah. My first ever online private lesson was with Hobson Mora in 2008 because Dang. Skype and everything was going. And he was like, man, I got this idea. Let's try to do a private lesson. And the technology, like, it was kind of working, but I mean, it wasn't working well. It was like pixelated, delayed. He's trying to watch and see and be like, no, put your hand here. And, and it took me back to, uh, it took me back to when we were in Brazil at that tournament I was telling you about him and Dream were coaching and I couldn't understand a word he was saying because his English was terrible back then. Like, you know, it was terrible and I just couldn't understand a word. And I'm like, you want me to put my hand where? And when we did that online <laughs> private, I was like, man, I'm having flashbacks of Brazil, man. This is the same <laughs> yeah. thing. I, don't, I can't tell what I'm supposed to do. Did, yeah. did you have an Uki um, or did he have an Uki? Like I had, a- yeah, we both had partners, which made it okay. easier, uh, yeah. which right now a lot of people are struggling with. We actually did a grappling dummy challenge at the gym. So we were like, everybody see who can make the greatest grappling dummy. And one of the guys got some pool noodles and a duffel bag, an inferno bag, stuffed it up with a gi. Man, uh, it actually is pretty legit. So now uh, Josh is posting a video every day in the group of him doing something on this grappling dummy. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just because right now we just got to stay entertained where we yeah. can't train like normal. We can work out. We can watch technique. But I think that's where conversations like this and just different aspects and keeping it fun helps keep everybody a little bit loose because, you know, people are a little bit stressed. This is a real thing, and um, yeah. it wears on you a little bit. I don't know that I've ever received more memes in my life. Like everyone's yeah. just, and it's just, it's funny, you know, and it's just like, it, but it's nice though. Cause you crack up and you still have the sense of community a little bit, even though you're not there together. Yeah, man. I'm just glad that we have the technology to kind of, you know, pull people together. Cause like the last two months of my life have just been crazy, crazy busy. Um, and with this whole Corona thing coming in, like that just multiplied it where, I mean, it's, it's, it's been a very uh, unique time with my life as far as time and sleep. And I it just, whew, man, I've been pushing hard. So I've been kind of neglecting a lot of my people where everybody's like, Hey, are you still alive? So I'm like, man, maybe this will give me some time whenever I can kind of get all the gym stuff, you know, flipped over and converted to where we're engaged with everybody to try to catch up. Cause that was one thing I was, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine about was uh, that was my goal for next year. Oh, that might've been you. I think we were talking about that. Like my goal for the next year, my, one of my goals for the next year was trying to just like engage in my social groups and my people more because yeah. I've just been dug in a little bit too deep lately. So, you know, maybe this whole thing, you know, there's a silver lining out of this because everybody's getting to heal up. Everybody's getting to, you know, connect and kind of communicate with people differently. And, and it's forcing people to grow, especially like on the business side with the guys running gyms or people that are employed. They're having to find ways to deliver value and engage with people. Yeah. Uh, in a different way and I mean and a lot of growth comes from that so I think it'll it'll benefit a lot of us because you know I know you being a finance professional um, you know which we'll get into that because I, I do have a couple things on that one you know it, it changes the it changes the the playing field as far as yeah. how the world's operating right now but before we get to that though a couple things so one if you had to pick your biggest takeaway from Hickson what would it be oh man I know um, that's a tough one Let's see. Uh, there's, it's, it's, I just, like three weeks ago, we did the, it was me and two buddies, but we did, uh, we ended up training with Hicks and, and you know, we took breaks and we're just talking jujitsu and stuff, but four and a half hours. But it was just like, 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 I, it's not even, I'm, maybe my mind's blown, but I just, I, I haven't processed everything yet. But um, I think, um, 
Uh, let's see. I would I would think maybe the idea of connection and just taking Slack out before you go for a move. Yeah. Um, uh, like so, yeah. He's got this thing called connection. So the way that I define it is there's three types. Um, a lot of times for you to generate power, you got to really connect to the floor. Like you'll it, let's say you're trying to do a, a cross side escape and you'll see people flailing their legs. They can't generate any torque. They can't really go anywhere because their foot's slipping. So yeah. you really have to connect to the ground on a lot of on a lot of moves and standing in like really good solid base. Um, so that's one part of connection. The other part of connection is your body has to connect to itself. And when you can move it as a unit, um, uh, you can generate a lot more power and stuff like that. Or like, let's say you're laying on your back, your legs are up, you throw your legs down, they hit the mat, and then you try to do a sit up. Like your body was disconnected. Yep. But if you lock your core, and then, you know, you can generate momentum and you can move. And um, so you, your body has to connect to itself. And then lastly, um, you really, the, one of the most important aspects is you really have to connect to your opponent. Um, Cause sometimes if your range of motion is this big and you, there's this gap here, you're actually, you know, you move a foot, but you move the guy like an inch. But if you connect first and you, you, you have a firm, there's like no wiggle room and then you go, their body really goes like, there's a move I love to show that where um, if you're, uh, you guys call it uh cross, bo- what do you call it? Cross side, cross body side control. Okay, so- now side control okay your side control you switch switch your hips to do that step over to mount yep um if i have i want to have my arm under your armpit right and if, if i try to bridge you just keep your foot planted and it's impossible to, to knock the person over if they, you've got like wide legs and your feet on the ground it's like boom but it's so weird if you just engage your your shoulder and you just kind of move into them first and you take out all the slack. It's like even though you, you're like kind of touching the guy and you're going to explode into him, there's a little bit of slack. So when you take that over and it's like you kind of like it's a teeny bit of strength. It's not like you're straining and like, you know, whatever. But you engage in them. When you bridge, they will 100% just fall over. And you'll see them go like, whoa. And um, so it's like just all those taking out the space and all these different moves. Yeah. Uh, I had Hicks. So that's like a. I've I've heard people talk about it like you know explosive movement versus continuous movement. Mm-hmm. Like I can explode, but like you said, a lot of the movement is dispersed with the space yeah. and the gap. But the continuous movement, because like if you can just go that extra inch, I mean, it's just like a good cross choke, man. When you just like a little flex on the yeah. wrist, yeah, man. Sometimes that's yeah. what you need. Exactly. So, yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, next thing. We don't want to get too fancy, but so apparently you got to train with Maynard from Tool. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And that's just a cool story, man, because, you know, like every hardcore martial artist in like 1998 was like Tool is just, you know, yeah. Yeah. Cool play yeah. the gym, right? Yeah. And apparently he's like back on top that album, their new album. Um, I think it was the number one rock album last year. I haven't listened to it. I'm very disconnected from like the media and stuff like that just because I'm dumb, but uh, I, I the same thing. So I haven't necessarily been a, a major Tool fan at all. I mean, I I like the songs. I know a few of the songs, but um, yeah. You know, when that album came out and everyone was kind of like raving about it, I listened to it. And it's not such a CD that I'm going to put in uh, frequently. But man, I got to tell you, as musicians, if you listen to it, you'll appreciate just how freaking tight they are as musicians as a band. Yeah. It's like which, and that's the whole reason that uh, I'm bringing this up because. This is going to go to another thing because it's, okay. it's not about the name drop. It's about an interesting thing that we talked about. Um, so your other friend that you get to train with is Scott Kahn, right? Scott Kahn, yeah. Which, you yeah, know. He, he's the guy who told me um, uh, about his body feeling good for two oh, weeks. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah so that's that yeah. was Scott. He, but, he's uh, the Corona brother. <laughs> it's like, right. hey, man, if you need a fix, I'm your Corona brother. Like, I will, I will get sick for you. Like. No, he he. You know, he's like, no, stay away from me. He's like, yeah, yeah. He's on lockdown, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah. So, and funny enough, when I trained with Maynard, it was actually at Scott's house. Yeah. So, um, uh, I met. So Henry Akins had been uh, actually Maynard, I guess, started with Hickson in the '90s and got, uh, I think, up through Purple Belt uh, from the Hickson Gracie Academy, the original one. Yeah. And um, he. Uh, um, I guess Henry Akins had been uh, just always stayed in touch with him and coaches him and they're actually like friends and yeah. I know Henry, you'll see Henry, Henry post photos of it like going to um, Maynard's concerts and stuff but anyway so I was um, Maynard was in New York 
And my buddy, good friend, my really good friend of mine, Eddie Fivey, he runs Eddie Fivey Jiu Jitsu in upstate New York. He called um, and then asked if he could get that connection. And, um, you know, Henry had known Eddie for a really long time and really trusts him and everything. So he's like, yeah, I could, I'll, I'll ask to see if there's room. So Eddie ended up staying in touch with Maynard. And we were, when we went to um, Arizona for Crone Gracie's UFC debut, where he fought um, Alex Caceres, um, Eddie was like, hey, I need you to, you're coming to lunch with me. I was like, all right. So we drive to this really cool little old town, uh, Scottsdale. It's like a really just kind of like a, it's a, it's got a cool little vibe to it. And uh, yeah, I'm sitting down with Maynard and we're all having lunch. And it was Maynard, his business partner and Maynard's wife. And then Eddie and I, and we're just chatting and he's just like a really nice, normal yeah. dude. And uh, what was, um, yeah, anyway, it was, it was, it was pretty funny. Uh, so these guys is jujitsu performance potential because that's really what the conversation was about and that's what i really wanted to illustrate because mm -hmm. i feel like there's really a you know um, a golden thread in here so these guys perform legit jujitsu they do well they're gamers um they're obviously not getting to train full-time as much as anybody running a school they don't get to yeah. be jujitsu bums where it's like 24 7 you know they're doing the private lessons uh i you know they probably don't get to go to a class with 100 people in there and get to train you know every day with all the different body types and all that yet they're performing at high levels well i'll say this scott Kahn started back when i did in like 96 yeah. and so he, he came up grinding just as hard as you and i did like he's a legit black belt and his def i mean yeah. he, he's not a big dude but he you know his defense his skill like he's he's a really really good black belt like legit black belt and he goes to normal group class with everybody else he's not like oh, okay I, yeah yeah so he, but yeah, I know he some people just don't have that luxury like they just there's just no way they could just go to regular class you know and that's well, they're gonna get swarmed and all that stuff and then you get guys like Higi machado and i'm not talking shit because i don't know the, the his program at all but i there's apparently like this way you can teach a hollywood actor jujitsu so he doesn't you know, um, get injured or whatever. Funny, actually, I was training uh, up at Henry's when he was at Dynamics, and um, that uh, guy, Sean Patrick Flannery, was in there. Yeah. And uh, he's the same thing, group class, down to earth. He, I think he teaches at Hollywood Jiu Jitsu. Awesome. Um, like he's one of those, yeah. So they're like, dude, a lot of these guys are really, really down to earth. But it was funny, yeah. before I rolled with him, he was like, wait, hold on a second. Um, before we roll, I need to check something. And I was like, okay. And he touches my gi. And he's like, yeah, well, that's good. We can roll. And I was like, what was that? And he goes, dude, some guys get this really coarse geese and I get like this. And then it's just a nightmare for makeup. He's like, I'm filming. It's when he was on Dexter. He's like, I'm filming this stuff. Like, I, yeah. I can't have like. Well, it's real issues. I mean, it's, it's no different when you got guys that are, that are lawyers that can't get black eyes. So yeah. the thing that we were talking about was like, these people are very successful in part yeah. of their life. Like they are overachievers. They've done things. And so the thing was that transitive property of like, you know, are you seeing that in their jujitsu where like they know how to be successful at something and that's helping their jujitsu game? It's interesting. I, well, when I rolled with Maynard, um, I know that he's, his hip, I was told like his hips had, uh, like were bad. I think they were replaced. So wow. for me, yeah, I was, yeah, I was just like, I guess from just dancing on stage and, you know, just jumping and like, just, uh, you know, but um, uh, I was trying to be very careful with him, but I, I got to tell you, and it's funny because there's things that Hicks and guys do that like, you, you know, like every jujitsu, like you, you drink, uh, you, if you, any of drinks black belts, they're going to know, they're going to have at least these, these, uh, th you'll just see similarities in the game. Your games might be different and all that stuff, but there's those things that got just stapled into your core. If you go with the Gracie Academy, you, you'll feel the same thing. So when I rolled with, um, we didn't roll. We just, we exchanged technique and just trained a, a little bit. Cause he had a, um, he actually is, I guess, recording another, uh, an album for a perfect circle. So he's like, I gotta be good. I gotta, you know, I gotta just keep things chill. But man, his technique was on point. Like the, the posture and the guard and like the way he, his base and like the way he felt, I was like, that is a Hickson guy. The way that we do cross side, I'm like, okay, yeah. He's like, he's legit. Um, it was kind of cool. Cause he was showing me some of his setups for like Darce's, and um, that's not something I'm really big at. So it was cool to, um, to learn that from him. So he, uh, I would say, he comes across as like just a, I, and this is a, two interactions with him, but uh, he comes across as a highly intelligent guy, kind of very analytical and like listening and watching and learning and good questions. So um, I think that's that, that 
goes there. Scott is super down to earth, but he's just a he's just a regular dude like me, um, or you, or like he's just like a, he's just like yeah. a normal dude. Like, hey, what's up, man? Like, you know, it's not like respect me or like I'm you know who I am. There's right, none yeah. of that. no, and there's a lot of people out there that way. And just and I just you know when you see success, it leaves clues, mm -hmm. and that's why I like because when I run into these people that you know they whenever they're excellent at other things. You know, they struggle with jujitsu like everybody else does. Yeah. But they seem to get over the obstacles a little bit faster. Um, that might be I'm, true. Yeah, because it's like I see people that will come in that are they're overachievers in other parts of life, and they have the same problems like, you know, oh, I grabbed the wrong sleeve or I went the wrong direction. But yeah. they don't seem to stay in those areas quite as long. You know, I mean, something they struggle with. But And I think it goes back to almost like that successful mindset of like, this is how I achieve, this is how I perform. You know, this is how I move forward faster. And I feel like that's really what we're trying to help people learn a lot of times on the mat. You know, it's how to fail forward fast, as Dring always says, where it's like learn how to get better at things a little bit quicker. And that's yeah. why I'm usually always really interested in the guys that, that do jiu-jitsu that are overachievers in other areas. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because I got some friends that have been crossover athletes that do other things. And then, you know, friends that are just, you know, big time executives and stuff. And and no, and they struggle like everybody else, but man, they attack their weaknesses so aggressively to yeah, find yeah. a solution. Yeah, I, 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 I think that you're accurate in your observation. Um, that the other guy on Hawaii Five O, Alex, mm -hmm. he is like he, he's a, a like I've, I've trained with him like I don't know maybe five times or something like that, but like he is like really, really, really diligent in studies and like. He, he's there to drill and like, and probably from like doing shoots over and over and over, like I gotta get this right. Like he was really like, I'm here to just know, like show me again, let me do it again, let me do it again. So I uh, strived for that. I was gonna, I had one other thing I was gonna tell you about. Um, oh, we got a, a guy who sold, he trains with Kama. Um, I, I don't know, but I think he sold his business for millions, 10, 20 million bucks. Yeah. But, um, he 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 comes in and trains he gets privates from dave and he trains in group class now too but same thing like he's he he's the most polite gentleman in the world but on the mat he's there to like do jujitsu so he's got that drive to um to succeed that comes across in his his game for sure yeah so yeah I, th I think i would agree with your um your observation there that they they they're not just there showing up just just to train yeah right yeah it's like it's with purpose you know and yeah. um i mean because like when you look at time management of high achieving people man like their schedules are rough like it's hard for them to do anything so if they're going to yeah. spend time doing anything they're usually do like it. they're doing it you know yeah. and and that's one thing you know years ago i remember i was we were training i was with drink and i was still young and just trying to figure it out and I remember he was just like right up in my face. And he's like, if you're not here to be the best every single rep, then you might as well go home. And I was like, uh, okay. You know, yeah. because, you yeah. know, his intensity comes across really well. And, yeah. but, and at the moment, I just took it for the lesson in the moment. It was like, oh, yeah. I work harder right now. But now I look back and just intentionality, whether you're, you know, building a relationship with somebody or if you're working out, like when you just lift, it just that intentionality and the purpose behind why you're doing what you're doing seems to you know be so relevant and i feel like especially in jiu-jitsu which was my full circle was these guys are basically just kind of demonstrating that excellence mentality of just try to be excellent at what you do you don't have to be the best at what you do you just need to try to be better and overcome your obstacles faster um yeah. and and just kind of face the weaknesses and the challenges and and kind of let the pride and ego go away and just be like what do i do to fix this yeah. i remember uh advice i was given Whenever I was like, hey, I called Hobson and I was like, hey, man, this guy keeps choking me. It's the same thing and it's ticking me off. What do I do? I was like, how do I defend it? And he just said, let him get you in it about 25 times. Yeah. And I was like, are you crazy? I'm not going to let him get me in that 25 times. I'm trying to stop this. And he's like, hey, man, if you want to never get caught in it again, then, you know, this is what you need to do. And yeah. my pride and ego at this age, you know, I was just like, that's terrible advice. Yeah, no, don't do you know? that. I just saw a video of uh, Pedro, not just I, within the last month with Pedro Sauer, where he basically said, when you go to a new academy, show up and just be polite and roll and then let them catch you and then see what they did. Let them catch you. So you're actually just studying them. And yep. then when it's go time at the end, one, you made a friend and they see that you're not there to be, you know, to like flex on them. But then two, um, uh, 
you, you know their game inside and out. And they basically just refilled all their cards. And yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Let's you got it. the secrets. Yeah. You got the secrets. So I was going to read you uh, a quote. Um, uh, don't do anything as though you are an amateur. Anything you do, do it as a professional to professional standards. Yeah. If you have the idea about anything that you just dabble in it, you will wind up with a dabble life. There will be no satisfaction in it because it will be there will be no real production you can be proud of. Develop the frame of mind that whatever you do, you are doing it as a professional and move up to professional standards in it. Never let it be said of you that you lived an amateur life. Professionals see situations. They handle what they see. They are not amateur dabblers. So learn this for, as a first lesson about life. The only successful beings in any field, including living itself, are those who have a, prof a professional viewpoint and make themselves, I'm sorry, make, uh, have a professional viewpoint and make themselves and our professionals. Yeah. That's, that's it, man. And I think that the biggest thing that our job is as senior ranks is helping low ranks and people in the academy, people we train with, realize that they can approach life that way, mm -hmm. even if they're not a movie star, an executive, super athlete, best guy on the mat. It's not the, it's not the performance part that, that does it. It's the mindset of how you approach it and you will get momentum and you will get better at being successful because success is like anything else. It takes practice. And the more yeah. you're successful, the better you get at being successful. Yeah. It goes back to that um, thing. Have you heard of be, do, have? Mm -hmm. A lot of people want the have. They're like, Oh, I just want to be a millionaire. I need to be, I want to be famous, but it actually goes, well, you got to do the shit to have the stuff. But in order to do the shit, you have to be the thing. So the, you, the actual, it's the mindset first you be, then you actually have to do it, like put in the work, and then you can have whatever that is. Yeah. You don't just accidentally get a black belt. You have to be like, I am going to learn this. I am a judoka, or I am a, you know, a jujitsu arrow, however you say that. Yeah. I'm putting in the work, and now I'll end up getting my belt and the, winning the matches and all that stuff. I mean, yeah. it's like that in everything in our lives. And I think that transitive idea there, which is, you know, kind of why I brought up you know, you know, Maynard and Scott was, it's like, you know, it's cool and it's neat, but at the, at the same time, it's like, what can we learn from that? I mean, even with Hickson, I remember listening to Hickson talk years ago. Um, and it was like, whenever he was the best in Brazil, how did he get better? And it was right. like, Oh man, I never thought of that because when you're the best guy in the gym, yeah. it's, Oh, well, I better go find another gym. I need to find another coach. And it's like, well, what about when you're the best on the planet? How do you get better? And he talked about intentionality. He's like, I put myself in certain positions and in certain situations that I have to intentionally try to get out of. And, and a lot of those were, you know, put himself in trouble, deep arm bars, you know, how deep in the arm bar can you go? And I've had a few of my guys that it, it has changed their training as high ranks because yeah. they've been able to convince people like how close they are to submitting them. Cause you know, when you go up and you're like, yeah, go ahead, take my back. There's a little bit of like, oh, you're giving it to me. I'm not going to try to rip your face off, you know? Yeah. But whenever we're rolling and you end up on my back and you legitimately believe you got it and, like, you find that grip and you think you're winning, that's a whole different dogfight than whenever it's like, yeah, yeah. go ahead and take my back and, you know, get your grip. Right. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And it came from Hickson from, like, a long time ago. Yeah. The, um, Jason Robig, he's um, the kind of Crone Gracie, Hickson Gracie representative in um, – in, Australia, I think it's like, uh, anyway, in the Gold Coast, it's, so it's on the uh, northeast of Australia. But he, we, we were talking one time when I was down there, and he said that Hickson would find the guy in Brazil who's known as the, this is the guy who's got the best triangle choke. And it was this closed door training, show me that, do it, go. Yep. And I'm sure he got caught, and he figured out how deep, how this, and how that, and then he just worked it over, worked it over, worked it over yep. on defending and learning how, how to do it. And then he's like, hey, cool, I got that. And then it's like, all right, you're, so you're the arm bar. You're, you're the, the, you know, the throw yeah. guy. All right, we're going to do this. I wanted to read you something too because um, um, I texted Hickson, um, uh, just texted him. And he goes, hey, it's funny. He, he, he uses emojis a lot. But he goes, hey, brother. Oh, I saw, I, I, here's what I said. Hey, thank you for your message. Um, I'm happy you are well. And I'm excited to see the new content about the stuff he's recording now. Yeah. Um, he goes, hey, brother, thumbs up. Thanks. Take care. I keep practicing the invisible jujitsu. Breathing, visualization, strategy, and patience are key. 
and then a, a bunch of emojis and then be well. But it's that same thing you're saying is that visualization and then the strategy, like how am I going to get there? What do I got to, what do I got to do to have this happen? You know, and yeah. just work through it that way. Yeah. yeah. And, that's, and that's it. And it goes off the mat too. Cause like talking to Bruno the other day, he was talking about like, man, jujitsu goes like off the mat. Like you got, it's gotta be where it's outside of the school. And, and that's one thing I think that, you know, we all have in common doing jujitsu is like, we're just trying to help people get better, whether it's on the mat or off the mat and on the mat's kind of our area of expertise, but we're going to be all right. But, uh, appreciate you spending time with us. Um, kind of like we talked about earlier, just a lot of history trying to, you know, like Dring said, he said, man, usually these are the stories that we share over dinner and stuff where people kind of get to hear this stuff. So yeah. I'm glad people get to kind of catch up and, and kind of know some of the history and just the funny stories that go with it. And yeah. we're all trying to stay busy and stay positive right now. Appreciate yeah. you, you know, sitting around and talking with Jiu Jitsu with us and hopefully yeah. when things get back to normal, we'll be hanging out soon. Yeah, I hope so, man. I hope to see you and your wife. Um, yeah. Uh, also, just let me, and I'm going to say this to anyone who's watching, um, you can find me on Facebook. Hit me up if there's anything I can help you with. Same with you. If you need anything, um, yeah, just let me know. Cool. All right, buddy. Appreciate you. All Everybody, right. I hope you guys enjoyed it. We will uh, be posting this later so you guys can review it if you missed the live.